So what is a kickbox? This is a kickbox. Um, it's right here. Looks like a box of donuts. It's not. Um, it's a box that has a process and funding inside. So um, exactly what does that mean? So funding means it has a $300 gift card that a student could use to make their idea a reality. We tried to put as little red tape in this as possible. So as long as they could honestly justify it had something to do with their project, it, it, it was theirs to spend. And it also had a process to refine their idea. This was based on some design thinking of fundamentals and it was um, the purpose was to help them make their idea a reality. Um, so there was other stuff in the box too which I can't tell you and no one who has a box can tell you either. They signed a confidentiality. No they didn't but don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> there were some other things in, in the box and if you really want to know what that is you'll have to apply next time to see. Um, I got notes because I forget things. So to um, give you a bit of a background here, this is our inaugural year in a kickbox. We've never done this before. So we launched it in the fall. We, um, we went around to classes, talked to classes, sent emails, talked to student groups to get folks to apply. All they needed to do to apply was just to have an idea and to write a little bit about that idea. So we accept applications in November. We received 19 applications um, by the due date in December. And then a group of faculty, staff, and students reviewed all the applications and thought 13 of those re were interesting enough to give a kickbox. And today we're going to hear about nine projects that were finished. Um, and I have finished in quotes because that really differs f for the project. Like we're not, our goal was not necessarily to have a shiny project that was ready to be in stock on the shelves of Walmart. It was instead to give the students a chance to go through this process and to take this idea and go through that process. Whatever that outcome is, whatever shape it is, it differs by the project, but they all went through a similar process of identifying challenges, talking to stakeholders, redesigning their initial design. That's the process that they use for Kickbox and that they'll use in the future for other projects. Um, so one of the requirements is that everyone had to have a faculty sponsor that they met with throughout the semester. So thanks to the faculty sponsors, it uh, couldn't have been done without your help. So a big thank you to all the sponsors and smiley faces. Um, <clears throat> and also lots of other people to thank since this was our first year, we were sort of making it up as we went along. We talked with a lot of folks to get their advice, to get their feedback. Um, and this is a sh partial list, I'm sure. But um, so thanks to all these guys. So more smiley faces. Um, I think we're ready to start. Um, so the way this is going to work, everyone's prepared a five to seven minute presentation. And we'll just go through them. Uh, the first two have to leave early. So after the first one, we'll take a few m minutes for questions. After the second one, we'll take some questions. And after that, we'll hold the questions until the end, just so everyone has a chance to present. Um, and that's the logistical stuff. Questions about Kickbox or anything? I'm excited to see some cool stuff. <laughs> All right. So the first one is Mike Box by Alex Harris. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I have a handout that I'm just going to pass around. 
Uh, and while you're passing around, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about what my idea is about. Um, so uh, we heard about the cake box when Dan came to one of our design and production departmental meetings and and told us about it. And then my sponsor, Michael Smith, came up to me with an idea. We should make some ergonomic cases that will help protect our our theater department's microphone body packs from outside damage like physical impacts or, or some moisture because they're kind of expensive pieces of equipment and we'd like to make them last a little longer if we can. Uh, so after we received the kickbox, the first thing we needed to do was uh, to make a prototype and um, this is our, our prototype. Uh, I designed this in a program called Autodesk Fusion 360. It's a, it's a drafting program and um, well there were a few problems with it. Uh, for one, we couldn't actually fit the microphone in it. Um, I accidentally left the top part of, of the case completely filled in so there's actually no space for the microphone. Um, the other, one of the other problems we had was it was too thin to provide any sort of protection from, from physical damage so uh, it was back to the drawing board but what uh, one good thing that did come out of this was this is actually about the same size of the microphones that we were trying to protect so I was able to use this as sort of a, a sort of a model to to make our, our next <coughs> excuse me our next cases around uh, so I, I went I tried to go back into the the Autodesk program that I made this in and I was having some trouble I was having trouble getting it to do the, the things I wanted it to do. So what I did was I went to a different Autodesk program called Tinkercad, which is sort of a, a much more simple version of, of the Autodesk Fusion program. And I designed this behemoth of a case. Um, it's about a centimeter and a half thick around. And it is just it was just way too big for what we were looking for. Uh, it was it was big. It was bulky. It was thick enough to protect from a lot of physical damage. I I hit this thing with a hammer and and it didn't really do so much as as this little tiny crack here. So it it had the 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 strength it needed to protect from physical damage and the plastic made moisture kind of just run off. So I was more on the right track with this, but um, it was just way too big and bulky and. The sharp edges would have made it incredibly uncomfortable for an actor to, to dance or, or do other sort of physical activities in. Uh, so one of the things that we learned from this one is we had to find a way to make the corners a little more rounded and that we had to make it a lot smaller. So I went back into Tinkercad and I came up with this one, which is almost exactly the same as this except uh, about half half as thick, still just as strong, but um, a lot smaller and it would fit a lot better in, in the pouches that we use for our actors. And then we decided to take it to a, um, a belt sander to try and, and curve the edges a little bit. Um, and uh, once again, the results weren't as, as great as, as we had hoped. If, I don't know how much of it you can see, but right along here at the edge, there are a lot of open holes and cavities that uh, that we didn't really take into consideration that came from the 3D printing. So the thickness was was fine and and the sturdiness was fine, but uh, this is this was the last model I was out, that I was able to create. So the next the next part of my process, at least, is to find a way to to round to round the edges still without without having to, to take it to a sander or, or some other instrument to, to do it. So we can still have it completely enclosed, but not, not so hard and, and sharp, which would actually hurt a lot of people. And also, after that, we're going to actually try and put these on, on some of our actors and, and try to use them in some of our upcoming shows and musicals uh, in hopes that if it doesn't work out, we'll at least see what our problems are in use and and be able to fix it. Um, 
Another problem that, that we need to solve and that I'm still currently working on is uh, finding a way to keep the microphone in the actual box. Um, you can't really see it on the handout so much, but the inside of, of these cases have a cavity in them for the microphone to actually fit in. So I can take this and I can just slide it in the bottom and it should fit you know, fairly, fairly perfectly, but the problem that we have to fix for the next one is how to keep it in because it, a real microphone I could I could take it and it would just fall right out the bottom uh, so my next step along with actually testing it is to make a little slit in the bottom of it and put a little a little tab in it just to try and keep it from falling out of the bottom um, hopefully I'll be able to continue 3d printing these models in, in the Maker Hub and eventually try some some different materials than just the, the plastic that goes into them. Uh, but I think this I think this uh, this kickbox opportunity has, has really helped me uh, take the steps necessary to to creating something that, that is ergonomic and that really could be useful to our department for a very long time. Thank you very much. I actually didn't end up using any of my money. Um, I was one of the things that we had originally targeted spending the money on was uh, different materials to try and and use to 3D print, but we never really just never really got to a point where we pinpointed a material that that we wanted and that we knew was compatible with the 3D printers here. So uh, we we just ended up using what was available to us to to create some some prototype models. Where is the fourth model? Can you tell us how it differs from what we see there? Uh, the fourth model I actually tried to print twice and both times I I kind of got uh, kind of got screwed over by the printers. Um, the first time the, the settings were a little messed up so when I took it out of the printer and I, I squeezed it a little bit just to test it, it fell apart into four or five different pieces and uh, the second attempt um, I just the, the I just didn't have the availability I needed to, to actually 3d print it every time I went into 3d print um, someone else was was using it or it was it was just too late to, to really get the 3d printing started uh, but the differences between this model and the next model are uh, the little slit in the bottom that I mentioned to try and keep the microphone in and we actually made it even thinner uh, the size of this wasn't was was a lot closer to the optimal size that we wanted, um, but we decided that we could make it even thinner and still have it be just as just as uh, just as hard of a shell. And and so the the model that is yet to be three D printed is actually about as as thick as a as a sheet of Luon for those of you who know uh, woodworks, and that's about three sixteenths of an inch. My name is Alex Strelo, and I'm a student, um, a master's student in Elon's education program. Um, and I use my kickbox money to create a board game to be used in my chemistry classroom and also in conjunction with my master's research. So one of the things that I love about teaching science is there's so many everyday examples and experiences that students have that you can tie in when you're teaching new material. For example, if you're teaching the concept of gravity, a student may have never even heard of the word, but they've all experienced it. They know if you throw something in the air, it's going to come back down. Or if you trip, you're going to fall. Um, so the difficulty comes in when you're trying to teach um, material that they can't tie into their everyday experiences. And it's not easily illustrated in things that they see every day. Um, and one of those topics um, is stoichiometry. 
According to Merriam-Webster, stoichiometry is a branch of chemistry that deals with the application of the laws of definite proportions and of the conservation of mass and energy to chemical activity. So conceptually, it's very difficult for students to understand, kind of simplifying it a little bit. There's two main topics that we discuss. One is the mole, and I have my play on words for the board game that I created. So the mole is a unit of measurement, similar to saying that 12 eggs is equal to a dozen. Um, the mole is used when you're discussing a very large number of atoms. We also talk about conservation of mass and talking about how matter can't be created or destroyed. So the difficulty in the classroom comes in when I'm tying, trying to tie this conceptually difficult material in with mathematic applications, especially when my high school students haven't mastered the algebra that they need to complete these problems. So they become really overwhelmed and discouraged and ultimately very frustrated. Um, so when I saw the kickbox, I knew that I wanted to create some sort of instructional strategy to help teach my students this topic in a way that simplifies it and makes it a little bit easier for them to understand. Sorry. A lot of my development in this project was going back and looking at educational research and psychology, so I won't get into all of those. But there's three main factors that I wanted to look at when developing my game. The first was collaboration. I wanted to create a game that could be used in the classroom in a group setting so students um, can learn from each other and also I can collaborate with them and assist them. That leads, leads into the idea of scaffolding, which is the idea that students are assisted to complete some sort of task that they're not able to do on their own. Um, with the ultimate goal of them being able to complete that task independently. And scaffolding is, is kind of an inherent quality of games. And the third consideration was the idea of self-efficacy. So I noticed that my students were becoming really discouraged and wanting to give up and their confidence was tanked. So by integrating games in the classroom, I wanted to create um, a game that students, regardless of their initial academic ability, could succeed in little ways and by succeeding and the small things, their self-efficacy would increase and their confidence, and they would be more likely to attempt the more difficult problems. There we go, so that leads me to my board game. The most difficult thing I came across was in project development. So this is kind of a two-fold process. Um, the first was a creative process, and the second was technical. So when I was combating the um, creative difficulties that I faced. I knew I wanted to integrate those ideas of collaboration, um, scaffolding, and increasing student confidence, but I also wanted to create something that was simple enough so it could be integrated into the classroom, um, but complex enough to accomplish my goal of helping them understand this comp the concept of stoichiometry. So for example, in the classroom, you have time restraints. So I had to create something that would be able to fit into the time limit that I have as a teacher. I also wanted something that's engaging so that students would want to participate um, and engage in the activity so they could benefit from it. Um, so after I was satisfied with this creative aspect, then I ran into some technical challenges. Um, so I started very elementary, quite literally. I cut out construction paper and put it out on the floor um, to space out my board game. And then I was able to develop that using the application Sketch Guru. I was able to create a basic template to use for my board game um, and then use clipart.com, Ted Clipart, and produce my game using gamemakers.com. So future plans for my project, I want to post this electronically on Teachers Pay Teachers so other chemistry teachers can utilize this tool. I also am going to implement my research for my master's project. My students will be playing this in the classroom and then I'll analyze if this board game actually is effective in accomplishing my goals of helping students understand this concept. And finally, I'll share my findings with fellow teachers and at conferences. Um, so for more information, you can access my Hackaday page where I'll be updating as I will continue to work on my project um, or send me an email, arebel at elon.edu. Any questions? Thank you. We'll take some time for some questions too for Alex because she's got a little more. Too. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. 
I have not. So I have worked through it myself, but I haven't done it. I'm going to get a small test group to practice through it before I give it to my students. Could you maybe just give us like the elevator pitch of the rules of the game? Like this is the yeah, elevator. let's see if I can go to that. So I tried to lay out most of the aspects on here. So you have the basic board game. Um, students will get points for doing different things. Um, the one point questions, these will be very basic stoichiometry questions that they'll need to ask, and then they'll increase in difficulty um, as the points increase. Um, and these points will correspond to the little paths between these figures. So students will be able to complete them, even if they can only do the, the easy one-step problems, they'll be able to complete a little path there um, versus the more difficult three-point problems. So a basic, a basic question would be um, asking students to determine a certain mass of a molecule. Um, so they're kind of one-step algebraic questions. The two points ones correspond to two steps. And then the three points, you have three algebraic steps to finish the question. Yeah. Uh, so hello, my name is Robert Danis and I'm at a Smart Mirror, which um, is right over there. So first I'll just give a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm just going to briefly say who I am, um, give a brief little history about the Internet of Things. And I'll talk about why I decided to make a Smart Mirror, the early stages of development, challenges I faced, uh, where I am now, improvements or alternatives that I could have done, and then a conclusion. So like I said, um, my name is Robert Danis. Uh, I'm an accounting major with minors in finance and computer science, and the computer science minor is how um, I was introduced to the Cookbox project, um, as Dan and Michael came to my class to um, talk about it. Um, and so the Internet of Things. Uh, many of you may know the Internet of Things, um, just based on things like a Sonos system or the Nest um, thermostats that like learn what temperature you like at certain times of the day and automatically adjust um, based on those preferences. But the first um, connected device was actually built in the early 1980s by um, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University. They um, connected a Coke machine to a computer so they could track and see um, whether or not there was Coke still in the machine before they went downstairs to get it. Um, and this technology is used by retailers um, every day. Um, right? Like when, if, you, if you went to Walmart to get a Coke bottle, you would scan the barcode and then that would tell the system um, how much to charge you, but it would also tell the suppliers um, that one Coke can was just purchased since it, so that they need to, to, re, um, to restock that. Um, and then just, uh, I guess, my own perspective on where I, IoT will go in the future. Um, I think that connected devices, um, I think that, excuse me, like um, activity trackers are really what um, the future holds. Um, I know a lot of you know about like Apple Watches and Fitbits and stuff like that and how they track like your movements. Um, I just really think that um, Insurance companies will use this data. Um, they actually kind of already are. I know John Hancock gives up to a 15% um, discount on their pre insurance premiums if you give them access to your tracker data just so that they can better estimate um, your health and how to charge you. So I thought that was pretty cool. So why a smart mirror? Um, I feel like I've seen this design in um, futuristic movies. This is Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie The Sixth Day. Um, and like I'm sure a lot of you, when I get up, uh, I immediately check my phone, I check the news, I check what temperature it is, um, I check the weather, stuff like that. And before I know it, I've got 10 minutes to get a shower and get ready to go to class. And so I thought that this would be a way to kind of make me more efficient in the mornings. I could be getting ready while checking the news and the temperature and stuff like that. And I actually stumbled upon an idea um, prior to finding out about the Kickbox project. And so when I heard about the Kickbox um, 
kind of what it entailed, I got really excited and thought that I would I would create this project. Um, I'll get more into that a little bit later. So here um, is the mirror. Um, it's a two-way mirror plastic, which was pretty difficult to get, actually. Um, they don't have them at Lowe's or Home Depot. I had to order one online. Um, and as you can see, it pretty much just looks like a mirror, although um, it does show through. And so what I did to combat that was I just put a blue piece of construction paper over the back, and then those two um, pieces of cardboard were used just to make it easier to hang it up on a wall, um, although that resulted in me tearing paint off my dorm room. Uh, well, so, um, and then this little space is just where um, an Android tablet goes, and that is what displays the information. And then this is the first um, kind of screen that pops up when you open the program. It's the setup page, and it, as you can see, it tells you um, you can select if you want the temperature and either Celsius or Fahrenheit. It can show you uh, a biking weather hint. So, as we heard, there were some thunderstorms out um, a few minutes ago, and so when I was turning this on, it said, "Don't bike today." I had a little bike image, um, and that just kind of um, works based on if it's going to rain in the future. And then it does a mood detection, so using the camera, if you're smiling, it will say, um, it will say, I forget what it says, it says like, hey, or something like that, but if you're frowning, it says cheer up, bud. And then it can also show um, a next calendar event, or a BBC headline, um, a cartoon, and then if you input um, stock um, abbreviations, and the stock price moves by more than 3%, either up or down, then it will display that at the end of the day. And so here is kind of what it looks like, as you can see, showing the date, the time. Um, it has a cartoon, and then look and fly, that's what it says. Look and fly if you're smiling. Um, and then, as you can see where it says US state primaries, that is the end of uh, the BBC headline that said, Trump wins all five US state primaries. So obviously, BBC is very concerned about a presidential election, as they should be. Um, <laughs> So, some challenges. So if you saw me setting up, you'll know that some challenges I face are attaching the tablet to the mirror. Um, and that's just because I, I obviously can't code with the tablet while it's set up to the mirror. So I don't want to kind of permanently attach it because then it makes it difficult to come off. Um, and so it's fallen down um, several times. And as you can see, if you look on the actual mirror, um, it's ripped some of, the, some of the coding off on the back. Um, but I can just flip around the blue paper, so that's not that big of a deal. But also, um, as you might have guessed, um, this requires power. It has to be plugged in at all times, so that's obviously a big power drain. And so something I thought about was using some sort of sensor device um, to only turn on when I walked by it. Um, however, I couldn't get that to work. I tried a few motion detector apps that use the front-facing camera, but the, I didn't um, seem to get those to work. But, when, but a, a, a challenge would then be, if I walked up to it, it would just go back to the setup screen. And so I'd have to hard code um, the setup screen so that it wouldn't go there. Another challenge is when I would work on it. Um, so as I said, the stock price would only show up at the end of the day. And that took me a while to find out. I was very curious as to why that wasn't showing up. But it only um, shows up after the stock market is closed. And um, opposite, the um, on the other hand, the cartoon would only show up um, during the day, so that wouldn't show up at night. Um, so that, those are just things that I had to work around when I was working on the project. And so where am I now? So this is what it looks like, um, or you can see it over there as um, I just have the tablet on underneath. And so you can see, um, like it had before, the, the cartoon, the headline, and um, a bunch of other information. And I don't obviously have everything checked. Like, I don't have the biking hint. I don't have the weather on there. Um, I was just kind of toying around with it when I took this picture. But it's pretty helpful. Um, it's definitely not as distracting as my phone, so I'm a little bit more efficient in the mornings. Um, and some improvements or alternatives. So as I said, I had already kind of come up with this idea before I heard about the Kickbox project. And so once I, I found out about the project, I was very excited, and I kind of hit the ground running by getting the, the two-way mirror plastic and the um, tablet. In hindsight, I think I might have, I should have like researched different mirror, I guess, methods. Um, as you can see, this person made a very more, a, a much more advanced mirror. Um, uh, in the video he makes, he starts off by saying, what can I say? And then the middle screen happens. Um, and so that uses like voice activation. Um, it also uses the, the mapping system. 
and as you can see, it uses the entire mirror instead of just a tablet area. And that is because he, this is the, the back of the mirror, um, he used a Raspberry Pi device, something that I had never heard of before um, March 14th when the Maker Hub had their Raspberry Pi day. Um, and so I think the Internet of Things class taught here at Elon uses those devices. Um, I might be wrong, but I think they do. And so had I taken that class, I might have had some um, background knowledge on a Raspberry Pi device. But as you can see, it's a lot more technologically advanced um, than my device. The, the thing in the middle is actually part of a, um, it's taken from a TV. Um, so in hindsight, I think I should have um, you know, looked at different alternatives and possibilities before um, jumping right in. And then conclusion, um, I really liked the Kickbox project. I thought it was pretty cool. Like I said, I should have taken a step back before jumping in. Um, but I definitely hope it continues in the future. Thank you. So we'll hold off on questions until everyone's done. All right, John's up next with uh, Google Docs. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on your pamphlet you see that it's a window farm. It's actually a window garden. There is no animals involved in the system. Um, I'm Jonathan Hauer. Um, this is Ben Hay. Ben, sorry. Um, and we wanted to create a indoor hydroponic system uh, that was didn't involve dirt. So I love gardening. I think it's a, a lot. Of, it's a very fun hobby of mine that I do in the summer. I do it with my grandma. Uh, it's a, way, a nice way to pass the time in the summer, um, and I like it because it's really rewarding to make your own food. Uh, I really like the taste. I really enjoy off the vine um, flavors, just like fresh tomatoes and things like that. Um, there's something that always goes wrong, though. You know, either you go on vacation or something like that, you come back, and the, the whole garden is a mess because there's so many weeds there. You haven't tended to it. Let's say you forgot to leave the timer, put the timer on so it gets overwatered. There's a lot of different environmental factors and human error that can go in, uh, into a garden. So a lot of time is definitely consumed into actually making a plant and watching it grow and uh, seeing any benefit from it. So I kind of wanted to um, see if we could change that, see if we could do something different. Um, so we wanted to make a, uh, a, a system that would produce food um, inside 365 days a year um, without dirt. So I'm not a huge fan of pots because I've had pots in the kitchen. You water them, and the dirt kind of just goes all over the counter, and then you have to clean it up, and it's just a big mess. Um, so this system right here will actually use no dirt at all. Um, and we wanted something that would fit. Uh, it would be versatile. So you could put it in your window. Let's say you have a smaller window. Let's say you want to grow bigger plants compared to smaller plants. Let's say you want to do lettuce compared to uh, basil or something like that. So something that was modular based off of your needs and what you would want. And ultimately less hassle. Um, so there's a couple designs all out there already that uh, are made very um, inexpensively and resource minded. Um, so one of these designs is a drip irrigation type of design uh, where they use um, water bottles upside down and they actually put a growing medium in the middle and it uses one pump, an air pump, and that pumps water through the air or through a tube um, and, and kind of drips down. Um, these systems are great. Um, for me, I didn't really want to use water bottles, um, although it's like a great way to use a, a waste product um, for, for your benefit. I didn't really want to go that route. 
I also think that the, the size is limited to what you can grow. Um, so I definitely wanted to do something a little bit um, uh, geared up, I guess, so that I can handle more or do more with what you want with it. Um, but I wanted to go with kind of the vertically hanging design. Um, I think that in a way, in the side window, you're kind of uh, off to the side, and it's not on the countertop, it's not in the way, it's just it's there doing its thing, and it's not really invasive, in, invading your, your cooking space or anything like that in your kitchen. We had some challenges. Uh, there's different types of hydroponic systems um, to go with. Um, so we kind of just went with one and stuck with it. There's definitely different ideas to go with other ones. Uh, way to display it, so we didn't want to just pick a window and start hacking away at it, per se, I guess. So we wanted to um, build a structure around it that we could frame it in and display it. Um, Hanging it was an issue because we wanted to make it modular, so it kind of like if you wanted more growing plots, if you had a bigger window, we wanted to be able to add that. Or if you wanted taller plants, we wanted to be able to make it so you can adjust the levels of height. Um, and flow was an issue. Um, so as I said before, we needed a way to display it. Um, so what I did was uh, went through lows entirely multiple times and find a door jam. So we were trying to remain in cost. And so it's actually a old or a new door frame. Uh, it was much taller, but we cut it down. Um, and then just reinforced the two by fours for a structural element. Um, in order to stay within budget, we tried to use as many pieces as wood we could find. That's what the top piece of wood is. That's why it's taller a little bit, it's just so we could keep our cost down. Um, in the future, another way to keep the cost down, uh, I didn't think of this before, but apparently uh, thrift shops have old window frames that artists use a lot of times. Um, so that would probably be the way to go, save me about 35 bucks. Um, and I'll let Ben talk about the support system. Um, so initially, we were thinking that we would support the system with a tension bar. But as we went along, we found that tension bar probably didn't have the strength to hold up everything that we wanted. Um, so we moved on to a different idea. We thought about maybe doing like an internal structure within the window, but we thought that that would probably be too invasive and we weren't really sure how we would do it. Um, so what we ended up doing is we went with the hooks. Um, and which, as you can see, we hung chains on, um, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and then uh, for the growing plots, uh, we had a couple different types that we were looking at. Um, this is the one that we actually ended up going with, and what we did is we cut from about here to here off uh, to make it a little less tall so that the plants could go in there easier and it would take up less space in the window so you'd have more room to grow plants. Um, but we were also looking at maybe like a different, more decorative wooden design, which would have been sturdier and easier to hang, but it was also heavier and a little bit too expensive. Um, and we wanted a nice, cheap way to get all this done. Uh, and the next problem was, how are we going to hang these plots? Because if we just stuck the chains through the plastic, it uh, probably would have compromised a lot of the structural integrity of the actual growing plots and probably wouldn't have looked very nice, and it might have caused a little bit more leakage. Um, so what we ended up doing was we made these PVC frames. Um, and so one side is actually a little bit shorter, so it supports itself against the window, which gives it a nice, sturdy, resting spot, kind of. And uh, it also lets us easily make a frame that fits just right to the growing plot and allows us to stick those chains down. Um, on both sides to keep it really nice and stable. Um, yeah. So Ben just kind of talks yeah. about that. Uh, the solution of that of to try to keep it so kind of like an earthquake proof test, you know, let's say the cat rubs up against it, something like that. We didn't want it to shake or water spill anywhere. Uh, so that was a challenge we had to, to overcome. And so we kind of just put the, the, the outside ones a little bit longer so it's adding pressure to the window. So it has a um, little less movement involved. Um, the reason we went with PVC was low cost, it was modular, you get it was customizable, uh, we could do what we want with it. It's actually not serving too much of a water flow purpose. Uh, the water goes through here, 
um, and then it kind of drips down um, that part right there, that little nozzle. Um, and so we just use a standard water pump, flow the water through, um, and this is the bottom of the design. And again, the water comes out right here. Uh, and then where we saw challenges is right around this little nozzle where we cut through, and we tried using um, silicone adhesive uh, to um, stop that kind of leakage. As you can see right here, we have a drip. Uh, so the solution to that was um, to put a rubber garment right in the middle, and then also our fancy, very cheaply made uh, little drip catcher. So that was just kind of a last minute Hail Mary put up. It works very effectively. Um, it's obviously a prototype, doesn't really, it just serves a purpose right now. Um, so in the future, we're definitely trying to make it more watertight. Uh, so these are how we initially designed it, kind of laid it everything out. These are the uh, ingredients that we add to the water reservoir in order to get, deliver the nutrients to the plants. Uh, we 3D printed this, um, this neti cup holder, that's what these uh, cups are called. Um, and they're, they're permeable, so you can see inside here, uh, it allows the root system to go right through, and these clay pebbles act as a growing medium in order for support for the plants. Um, and so we put all these things together after make, making this whole design and put the plants in. Uh, important parameters to monitor were uh, dissolved oxygen levels. Uh, the, the, the roots need dissolved oxygen in order to, uh, to grow. Uh, the pH levels based off of the nutrients and how much light it was getting. So future plans would involve uh, monitoring those levels with uh, sensors. Um, and kind of uh, just trying to make sure that it will tell you when you need to add water because you have to worry about evaporation. We'd also want to do a, an enclosed system so there's less evaporation. Also, so again, the cat can't drink out of it. Or if you wanted to put it outside, we make a model like that as well. Went to the Burlington Maker Fair. We had a great turnout. Um, people really liked it. People respond really well to uh, our design, and, and they, they said they would want something like that in their house. Um, also, future possibilities would be to get rid of the nutrient part of it and add a, uh, a fish aspect to it. So you can actually have fish that would feed the, uh, the plants themselves. Um, and that would be another cool way to do it. Um, but typically, uh, that's about, we want to add sensors so it'll let you know when you need to add everything. And um, it would be an easy system to use so you can go on vacation and not worry about it. Uh, we'd also just like to thank Dan and Michael and our advisor, Dr. HL, for making this all happen. We really had a lot of fun with it and we, we appreciate the opportunity. Hey, hello. Uh, my name is <clears throat> my name is Pete Victorados. I'm a freshman. Um, I'm still deciding my major. It was between engineering, physics, and communication design, but I still don't know. Um, so initially, all right. I'll sh I'll show you this video up first. The reason I heard about the kickbox is because I actually live on the same floor as the Maker Hub, so I kind of walk by it every day. And then I saw this, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then at around the same time, my physics teacher showed me this uh, cool video of this pendulum weight. So it gives a cool effect when you make all the lengths of the pendulum different gives off a cool little sine wave. 
And initially I thought, like, oh, this is so cool. Like, That would make sense. All right. So initially I thought, as the kids probably thought, oh, this is fun, science, you know, art. Those are things I like. So I was like, this is a possibility. Might as well try it. However, being an adult, you learn about, oh, I'm sorry. Wrong slide. OK. Liability, budget, property authority. So in terms of liability, making something that big on campus, I don't know where I would put it to begin with, making something that big would be a huge liability issue because there's kids always running around at night knocking stuff over. So you don't want to get your property destroyed. Um, budget, initially I thought that I would be able to go to the bowling alleys nearby, get some donations, but none of them had donations for me. And you'd, I wanted them to be around like the same weight, so that would have been a... I would have spent my entire budget on just the bowling balls. So, didn't want to do that. Property authority, as you can tell, Elon's a really nice place. I feel like they're kind of touchy about how they want it to look. So, kind of just coming in saying like, hey, I got money to do this. Can I just build on your property? I don't think that would fly with them. So, I figured if I scaled down, maybe I could potentially plan, uh, present it to the university. And backtracking, uh, Kind of how the pendulum system works, as I said. That's how a pendulum works. It goes back and forth. There's a mass at the bottom. The mass doesn't really matter. It's all about the length of the pendula. As you can see here, this gives a really cool effect from the side, which is what I wanted it to look like. However, well, we'll get to this later. Um, so as my inspiration, this is a video. And the issues I already went over. Very upsetting. So initially, I had some drawings. I, I thought that um, I, I had to figure out uh, which material I was going to use uh, rather than using the bowling ball. So I thought tennis ball is a little bit too big. Um, I eventually came to see, um, found some golf balls. So I was like, OK, this will work. Uh, lots of kids here golf, so a lot of my friends just kind of threw me some golf balls, which is pretty nice. And. Um, after that, there were a few different like mechanics that I had to go through. You had to figure out the angle to make the wood, um, some kind of a mechanism to allow swinging, and what kind of material you're going to use for the actual like length of the pendula. And then a big uh, issue that I ran into that I still kind of trying to figure out is a system that releases all the uh, pendula at once. Now, right now, I literally just threw this together. It kind of just pushes it all, which it does work. However, it's not the prettiest looking. And as, I, as I'll demonstrate later, um, it's not the best support system right here. So they, kinda, they don't swing exactly perpendicular to the axis they're on. So they kind of knock into each other, and it kills the effect. Um, so as I was saying, um, finding the materials for the pendula, at least, or at least the lengths of them. I bought some metal wire. It was way too rigid. I used fishing line at the end. However, I realized that fishing line, like if you bend it hard enough in the direction, it'll stay like that. So that could alter the paths of these little, little guys. And then another challenge was math, which I love math, but you know this was really frustrating trying to like measure all this. I've never done something like this before, so trying to measure all the wood, how to make both sides exactly alike. Kind of a lot of going with the flow went on. So I found one length that works for at least this uh, support, and I just made four more of them just by drawing it rather than going through math. And then you probably can't see it, but like this wasn't level, so I just put a little piece of wood right there to make it level. And Another challenge was the long journey from the engineering building to this building where this fell off <laughs> because this was not uh, sh uh, stable enough, unfortunately. And I also kind of felt weird like pushing this around in a suit. People were like, oh, what is that? That's so weird. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> um, and so 
Uh, this is just the basic design. I really wanted it to be uh, just uh, like long length to short length. However, um, I ended up just doing a little uh, like peak, I guess, which I'll show you the different effects. And let me demonstrate it before I go to the future. So the effect works at first, but then after a while, like I said, they kind of start knocking into each other. So there's that. It's pretty cool. And actually, in the video I showed initially, they did a really good job constructing it. And it does all cool sorts of effects. And they also put little copper tubing at the bottom. So the bowling balls would hit them, make sounds. It was pretty cool. And in terms of the future, um, I want to clean this up. This was like one of the design aspects or ideas I had. And I kind of like it, but there are some other ones that I'd rather have done. And potentially, if I can get a fully working model, maybe I could present to the university, say, hey, like, I really think that McMichael should have something outside of it to um, bring people's attention to the science building, because I know they're trying to build the science and engineering department. That's why I really like it so much. And uh, that's pretty much it for me. And thank you. Hi, so I'm Keely. I'm part of the rocket team at Elon. Um, my name is Julia, and uh, so Elon's rocket team was started this year um, for the sole purpose of entering into a competition in the summer of 2017. Um, it's an international rocket um, competition hosted by um, the Experimental Sounding Rocketry Association, um, EPOC, and uh, the competition basically is that you some other challenges involved as well. But um, this year we've just been working on our scale models of our larger scale rocket and working towards being ready for the moon. Okay, so for the kickbox, uh, we were focusing on the recovery systems for our rockets. So for us this basically meant like um, a parachute, an altimeter, we also wanted to incorporate maybe some cameras so we could get some like shots of our rocket and like show them off. Um, so here's our parachute. We just have some pictures and some videos of the test. So in our first test, if you want to show them. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty ceremoniously dropped to the bottom there. Um, it was just solid, and we decided that we want to put like a hole in the top to help reduce drift. Um, and so what ev eventually happened was we measured the hole wrong, and it basically turned into like a glorified skirt. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing was putting like a cross of fabric across it. So it's sort of like a hybrid parachute now, because <laughs> there's some smaller parachutes you can get, which actually are cross-shaped, and those help reduce in drift. And that combined with just the other parachute materials should make a, a, an improved parachute. Um, if you want to show the other video. <laughs> so, so that went <laughs> a bit slower than the other one did. So um, that's going to be tested in our half scale. And our half scale should read a reach about 1,500 feet. And so from that high up, it should really do a lot to help slow down our rocket and make sure it isn't damaged when it hits the bottom. Um, and as for altimeter, I don't have any pictures of that because we built it, and then it didn't work <laughs> for about like two months. And so we troubleshooted it, and we just finally got it to work. Um, so it will 
take the altitude and you can plug it into a computer and it will display the altitude there, but the battery to it won't actually power it up. You have to have it plugged into the computer and the display on it isn't working, so that's another thing we have to work past. Um, and so once we get that working, we should be able to use it. Um, so we also built an electronics bay and we actually have an altimeter there right now, but that's just commercially bought. We bought that to hopefully you know, compare the altimeter that we built to that one and see how they fare. Um, and then we have, this is a GoPro. We cut a little window out of our nose cone so we could get a shot of it going up. And um, we also have like a little prototype, yeah, Julia has it, of like kind of like a periscope. So you could hopefully put a camera inside of, like, see the white portion on the bottom there, thinking about like cutting out a hole there for the lens and then having um, the periscope kind of look down so you could get a downward shot of the rocket going up. Um, so here are prototypes. This is just when we first started. The red one is our one-fifth scale. And this is just a model rocket that we built just to practice like shooting up like with safety procedures and that type of thing. These are just some small rockets that we 3D print, well, Julia printed over the summer. Um, so if you want to show off our videos of those. Yeah. So that's the tiny blue ones. They just have an A motor, which is about the smallest motor you could possibly buy, except for maybe like a half A, which is And that's um, the rocket that we built for my kit. And then we have our fifth scale uh, rocket. Yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. Uh, <laughs> a bit of technical difficulties. So after that, we did our fourth scale, um, which you can see there. We actually don't have it with us because it went up and it did a corkscrew and smashed itself into the ground. Um, so you can see it's broken pieces there. <laughs> the parachute never deployed. Um, and we were on a, a smaller field, so it actually smashed into the pavement instead of the grass where it should have landed. Yeah. <laughs> So this is our third scale. Um, oh. Oops. We have a few shots of that. This is the biggest one that we've launched so far. It has an E-motor in it. Um. Shoot for it was a little bit too small, so it actually didn't drift very far. 
See us kind of looking around for it. And this is our half scale that we're currently working on. We haven't launched it yet. We're currently trying to find a place to launch it. Um, we can't, all our previous ones, we've just launched on launched at Elon in the, in the fields. That's what they're called? Fields, I don't know. Mostly O'Kelly field. Um, but they're going to be too small for our half scale. So we're trying to find, we've been contacting farms for that. Um, and hopefully we'll be launching weekend after next, maybe. Um, so for this one, we're going to be able to test out our parachute, finally. Um, so we're excited about that. And we've been thinking about maybe using our parachute as a drogue for our final, but we went to some launches last weekend where they use like really high-powered rockets, and we found out that our parachute is going to be way too big for a drogue, so we're going to have to make new ones for that. We have plenty of material, so we shouldn't have an issue. I think that's all I have for you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Afan Yobi, and I'm the CEO and founder of Our Watch. I'm Keith Davis. I'm the co-founder of Our Watch. Um, so, hearing about the kickbox, um, I'm a computer science major, and Michael kept coming into a, a different classes talking about the kickbox, and it was more so I thought so. Um, it was more so geared toward hardware, like actually making physical objects, like you see from the other group. Um, so I pulled them out the class. I walked out and said, "Hey, Michael, uh, me and my uh, friend are starting a business, but it's more so." Uh, geared towards software, so we apply for the kickbox, and he was like, "Um, oh, yeah, that actually would be great because all we have pretty much is hardware, so it'll actually be pretty nice to have someone with a software program in it, um, with the kickbox." So that's how we heard about it. Um, so for us, uh, it was a little bit different, just because we weren't really starting from scratch. We had already had a basic general idea of what we were trying to do, uh, and we already had the majority of our materials written out, kind of at the point where we were. So our main focuses for the kickbox was for us to get our trademark, um, to get our logo done, and to develop a business plan. Um, and those were the three things that we really focused on whenever we were uh, doing the, during the kickbox program. And we accomplished all three, and we even got our LLC yesterday. So uh, we're pretty happy about that. And uh, so now we're going to go into a little bit about what is our watch. Um, our watch is a cloud-based social media platform a database system that allows people to upload videos of dash cam and body cam footage. So all that basically <laughs> means is that it's just a mobile application that allows people to upload videos of crime scenes. So if we were standing outside right now and somebody who really hated books decided to burn down Belk Library, we could, we could have recorded it and uh, we'd be able to send it to our local law officials. And, uh, the three things here uh, that we have the time to all watch is the community law enforcement, and both of those, they make our watch. So the community, um, that's pretty much everybody in this room, everybody that's walking around daily, just regular civilians. And then the law enforcement, that's when you bring in police officers as well as judges. And between us two, um, we, we'll make our watch become a reality. Um, so how does our watch work? Um, so it runs primarily off of surveillance and observer footage. So that'd be you guys. Uh, if you guys saw a crime scene, uh, we just really need you guys to record it for us. Um, and we'll be collecting video from uh, um, community members and local law enforcement as well. So we'll be uh, collecting and storing and archiving their dash cam and body cam footage permanently. Um, and it'll be held on a cloud-based database system. And uh, we're thinking about using Amazon Web Services. Just as because it's the cheapest thing, uh, pretty much it's the most affordable. And we don't actually have to have any kind of hardware. Um, and it's going to be all regulated through a social media platform 
um, where you don't really have to actually have the video and it's all on the cloud and anybody can have access to it. Right, so what makes us different from other people? Um, the main thing, we're trying to build a community bond. Um, this idea of all that came from the distance between police officers and civilians, like all the recent crimes of uh, individuals being killed by cops. So that's where it came from. So we're just trying to build a strong bond between the two groups because police officers, they're supposed to protect us. And so we shouldn't feel like we should shy away from them or not contact them because we're scared they're going to come and do something they shouldn't do. Um, and then also with our watch, we plan on keeping all of the video. Um, even after, just say, this uh, crime, it goes to court. Even after the court, they plan to keep that um, video. We're, com we're going to compress it, but we're definitely going to keep it just in case three years uh, later down the road it come back up. We still have the video for you. Um, and just like um, Emmanuel said, it's just a... It's a platform, it's just a basic social media, you pull out your phone, record, just like Snapchat. You know, most of y'all probably use Snapchat, so it's going to be just like that. And that's really big, just because you have a lot of uh, a lot of police officers going to companies such as Facebook, YouTube, um, and they can't, either they can't get the video due to copyright issues, or they can't use the video because the video could have been tampered with. But none of that can, can happen with our watch because as soon as you uh, record the video, it automatically gets uploaded to the cloud, and there's no way for you to edit the video in any form. And we just specifically focus on collecting crime scene evidence. Um, our target audience are local citizens, local law enforcement, and local regional and federal ju judicial systems, and you guys. Um, we just really want to bring all three together to have them working under uh, uh, a nice fluid and complete system and that's one of the things that we saw whenever we created our watch is that there was a lot of partial answers um, a lot of hardware answers uh, specifically body cams but there was no like complete software answer to the things that were going on um, so we decided to go ahead and create it um, so this is our uh, revenue generating model um, so we'll be uh, doing software licensing uh, our app will be freemium based, but for the majority of the public, our app will be free. Um, that was something that was really important to us. Um, we will be uh, collecting ad, uh, ad revenue, and uh, we'll be selling back our analytics that we get uh, from consumers. Uh, so these are the reasons why you should invest in our watch. Um, we have a first mover advantage to global and local community sur surveillance sector. Uh, nobody else is really doing this on the scale that we're really trying to do it. There's other companies such as Taser um, who are making the hardware for body cams, but nobody's really focusing on the software side because a lot of these companies don't really want to give the people a voice, and that's what we're really aiming to do. Um, really integrate law enforcement and community partnerships, improve evidence collection and database, access recovery for police officers, organize, capture, sort, and retrieve real-time footage. So we're, um, I'll let Keith talk about the community aspect a little bit. Just poke at it right quick uh, about our app right quick. Okay. So I think we got, you're showing up oh. a video uh, later, right? Okay. You want to show it now? It's up to you guys. I'll show you a video, and I'll talk about it afterwards. So this video is me pretty much demoing exactly like the prototype that we have for us, the database, as well as the uh, app for the phone. Walk your screen. Here's where you would log in, of course. Um, you want to put the wrong password in. Um, as you see, when I put the wrong password in, it counts me down. So I get to zero. Once I get to zero, I no longer can log in. I just have to close the app. So now I'm going to log in with the correct password. Um, this is a home screen. This is just a prototype, so this screen is definitely going to change. Um, but this is a basic idea of our prototype. When you swipe right, it opens the camera so you can record it. You swipe left, it takes you to the community page. Right now it's just YouTube, but in the future this is where you will see all the videos that you have uploaded as well as everyone in the community. You will see their videos on this page as well. Back at the home screen, you can double tap the screen. Right now I have it going to my number, but in the future it will definitely go to 911 so you can call the cops right from double tapping on the home screen. All right, so this is now the prototype of our database. Um, as you see, you have the police officer's database as well as the public's database. 
Um, we click the police officers database. It brings up every police department um, that we have in our database. You click on the department that you want to look at. Um, once you click the department, it brings up every officer in that department. Um, in this column here is the badge number for every um, police officer. You click their badge number. It takes you to every video that they have for us, their dash cam videos as well as their body cam videos. So then you click a video ID um, and it takes you straight to their the video that their video ID is associated with. So right here, this is a dash cam video. And as you see, it plays a dash cam video. All right, so next is the public's database. Um, for the prototype, we really don't have too much in the public database just because most of it is done through the app. But here, this is where um, all the videos that was uploaded on the app will also be um, visible on our database. Um, and all these videos that we have on our database, every all the information, everything will be encrypted. So you won't have to worry about your information being linked, uh, leaked out or anything like that. Everything will be encrypted. I'll walk your screen. Um, and that was the uh, second prototype that we had developed of both the app and the database system. Uh, so while we were completing the kickbox uh, challenge, we had completed two, di uh, two prototypes of the database system and two prototype pr prototypes of our mobile application. And um, you know, Keith did a really good job with them, as you saw. Um, a little bit just about the community screen where you see me go to YouTube. Um, with that page, that's where you upload all your videos and anyone within like a 10 mile radius, they will be able to see that video. So if that person is criminal still in the local area, they can alert the cops. Um, we're also thinking about ways we can implement live chatting uh, to specific community members that you have. Um, just because it's just been something really big and we just really feel like it's a really nice way we could implement it to gain more, um, more of the uh, market area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith's got to run, but are there any questions? We'll hold uh, off on those until oh, after okay. the last one. All right, hello everyone. My name's Atticus. I'm a senior. Um, I'm studying economics, and my project for the Kickbox was um, an unused gift card platform. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my initial idea that I've been thinking about um, getting close to a year now, um, and sort of what I've been doing for the past few months, uh, which has actually just been a lot of research um, and like the guys before me, I'm also on the software side of things, so I don't have anything tangible uh, with me today. Um, but so it all started um, when I was uh, interning actually at a sort of a startup accelerator in Raleigh last summer. Um, and I had this idea that I finally put a little business model together using the uh, business model canvas. And what it is basically is all of those millions of dollars added up in unused gift cards, um, which um, recent reports have come out um, saying it's getting up to billions of dollars um, and sort of finding a way that we can channel all of that unused gift card money uh, to microfinance, which is something I'm interested in. Um, and microfinance, if you're not familiar, is uh, just distributing loans to poor people who are usually considered uh, uncredit worthy and don't have access to banks. So a lot of that happens in developing nations, uh, but there is some microfinance activity going on in the US now as well. So the idea is channeling these unused gift card balances into microfinance loans. And so I sort of had to tackle that. And what ended up happening is I have all these uh, complications with my research um, on the technical side of things um, and accounting and legal, which is sort of what I've been exploring for the past few months. Um, so what I found out is uh, payment processing is extremely complicated. Um, and I did a lot of research with that stuff. 
um, and I sort of did research about how the gift cards technically work, um, referring to like the magnetic stripes on the back and what stores are doing to um, use these gift cards um, and the difference between cards you can use at different stores like a Visa gift card and one you can just use at the same store like a Target gift card. Um, and so just going back to that, uh, one of the things I found out is all of these stores like Target or Walmart all have differing um, point of sale software which means all of these gift cards like you can only use a gift card from Walmart at Walmart and it won't work anywhere else and that's because each store has a different point of sale software that they're using um, which was a big thing for me to figure out um, when trying to solve this. Um, and so legal background of the unused gift cards in 09 they passed a law which said gift cards really can't expire and that's sort of the reason that uh, these gift cards have been accumulating um, in the past um, well, since 09 which is uh, getting up to billions of dollars um, and so the next thing I came to is is it bad for the stores that all of these gift cards are not being used um, and it's actually in the best interest of the store when gift cards uh, never come back to the store so the store has already collected their revenue you've paid for the gift card and someone coming back to use that gift card at the store is them giving away like free product at that given time in a way so it's in their best interest for you to never come back and use that gift card so breakage the term gift cards that never go used um, is actually a good thing for stores uh, which was also a big thing for me to figure out um, and then another thing is S cheat laws there are states that can say we actually own this unused gift card balance after a certain amount of years um, which vary from state to state but about half the states don't do that but the other half do um, which is another factor in this um, and so my vision at this time is sort of like a mobile app um, where I'm partnered with these stores and I have an agreement that they're gonna be willing to donate these small remaining balances on the cards uh, to my platform and then my platform will ultimately give it to a microfinance institution who will um, turn it into a loan and do what they specialize in. Um, so I'm sort of like the middleman in a way. Um, so I had to do all that research to sort of figure out is this does this logically make sense for stores and would they even want to give me these unused gift card balances? Um, and so I'm actually doing a field experiment right now. It's just sort of like a survey I'm distributing through Facebook and other things like that, social media. And it's just sort of like a data survey. That's a couple of slides from it. Um, it asks questions like how many gift cards do you own? Do you have any digital gift cards? Do you have any um, gift cards you can use at multiple merchants? And that's just sort of how I can get a sense of uh, at our market deal on what, what it looks like for gift cards. And then at the end there's a link which gives people the opportunity to donate those small remaining balances, um, which I'm doing through um, uh, another nonprofit which uh, gives their um, unused gift card balances to charity. Um, so it'll be cool to see if people um, feel like they can donate and if I do end up getting a lot of data that'll be pretty valuable I think. Um, so on the whole kickbox experience, I thought the cards were really useful and I'm definitely going to hold on to them for a while. Um, I really liked the sort of thought experiments um, that go along with them. Um, but I did wish that I planned in greater detail to spend the 300 because my idea felt very preliminary. And while I do feel like I've made a lot of progress, it still feels extremely preliminary. I know that uh, is a contradiction. but I haven't really spent any of the money, and um, I wish I had planned in greater detail for that. Um, but I did find the cards very useful, like I said, and it created a lot more time for me to work on this idea, which is something that I want to um, continue to work on um, after I graduate. Um, so moving forward, I want to sort of understand how gift card purchases work online, 
um, and sort of talk to someone who might know the answer to that and sort of explain like an e-commerce um, background for me and sort of what my needs are at this point. Um, and then I'd like to talk to um, some sort of gift card program exec from a uh, corporation and understand how their program works and so I can sort of align all the incentives for both sides of this. Um, and then in the long term, it's to build this integration, which I envision right now as a mobile app 